Hey everyone, and welcome to our latest edition of Eli on Air, the Eli Talks weekly interactive broadcast with interesting folks from across the Jewish spectrum, where we discuss ideas of Jewish engagements, literacy, and identity. And my name is Miriam Berceau. I am the Eli Talks program director, and I am thrilled to be sitting here with one of my musical inspirations, um, Moshe Hack who is a Hasidic singer-songwriter and, a, and a, a rabbi and a social media and marketing guru and just like an all-around renaissance man and a big old mensch to go with it. And so um, we're going to be talking today about finding inspiration in the every day and how Judaism does that, how music helps us do that, and it should be a really lovely conversation. So please feel free to send in your questions either right here via YouTube or we'll also be keeping an eye on the Twitter stream. Um, you can tweet at Eli underscore talks. You can tweet at Moshe if you like, or you can use hashtag Eli talks and we'll keep an eye on that and answer your questions right here live on the air. So um, with that, I am thrilled to introduce Moshe. Um, hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. How's it going? Hi, Miriam. Thank you. Very, very good. Thank God. It happens to be that you're actually one of my musical inspirations, so this works out really well. <laughs> oh, yes. All right. Mutual admiration society. Um, so, Moshe, tell, can you tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay, sure. So, my name is Moshe Hecht. I am a <coughs> singer-songwriter um, slash I'm also a rabbi. And I also work in um, marketing for different uh, startups, consulting, worked in a few startups. Um, yeah, in regards to the music, I uh, <laughs> released an album um, several years ago and have since had an unbelievable experience, um, you know, touring the world. We've been from London, Oxford, England, to Hawaii, throughout the States, to Eretz Yisrael, um, and had a few good years of just inspiring people and um, sharing my music. And now I live in, um, in Brooklyn with my dear wife, Nimi. Um, and yeah, that's my story. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in, in music and what inspires you? Absolutely. So music has always been <clears throat> a very big part of my life. Um, ever since I was a little boy, um, I wanted to be in the Miami Boys Choir. Don't I don't know this is being recorded, so maybe we can edit that one out. But um, yeah, always wanted to, um, you know, was always in cl class choirs, um, was always singing, was always a big passion of mine. Um, I started writing in my, started actually writing music in my early teens. Um, started off, we wrote a play um, in school, and we, in Montreal, we toured, um, it was a play for Hanukkah, and we toured through all the Jewish centers. Um, it was a five-scene play, and each and each scene had a musical um, uh, musical number, and that was where I started, you know, dabbling in music. And the response was very powerful. Um, and then I sort of moved into writing more personal compositions. Um, my inspiration, I'm Chabad, um, and my inspiration comes very is very deeply rooted in Hasidic philosophy um, and in Jewish philosophy. Um, yet I like to to really take those um, age-old ideas and sort of funnel them through my own personal experiences, my own personal outlook, and hopefully use that to share some inspiration with with listeners. Um, what inspires me, I mean, it's sort of really a full gamut. You know, it you know it it, it starts from Again, you know these Hasidic philosophies that I that I grew up on, um, you know Torah through the lens of, of the you know of through the lens of Hasidic and Kabbalah, um, and the, really the more esoteric and the deeper meanings and the whys, um, not so much the whats and the hows, but the, really the whys of, of Judaism, the whys of living a meaningful life. Um, you know, I always saw myself uniquely less as an entertainer, um, but more of hopefully an inspirer. You know, I never wanted to be like you know, getting up on stages and, and singing is not, um, you know, the core of it. The really the core of it is that if I can be able to relay um, a powerful message, 
um, to people that, that can really resonate with anybody from any background, of any affiliation, and um, any level of, of spiritual or religious observance for just to have a little bit of, um, that, that could resonate with them and maybe help them, you know, get where they're going, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's uh, been all about. Great. Can you, um, this may feel like a little bit of a sidetrack, but I want to make sure that everyone listening sort of understands a little bit more about where you're coming from. Can you just say a couple of words about, um, first of all, the word Hasidic? which I think has certain connotations depending on who you are and where you're coming from and what that means. And um, could you also just say a little bit about um, an example of Hasidic philosophy and what that teaches? Sure. Um, the Hasidic movement, Hasidic philosophy, um, was pioneered by the Baal Shem Tov um, a little over 300 years ago. The Jewish people were in a bit of a... Um, um, in a low place, and um, here comes this this shepherd, really, this uh, simple man who looks at the Jewish nation the way it was then. There was a lot of elitism going on. Um, there was a sh very strong divide between the great scholars and the simple folk, and he attempted to really close that divide. And I guess the essence of, of Hasidic philosophy is um, realizing that we all come from the same source, that the every single Jew and mankind um, has a living, breathing soul. And when you live a life of in this reality, um, all of the fragmentation, all of the divide begins to fade away. And one of his greatest um, mantras was the simple love for the fellow. Um, and he effectively in his lifetime and then through his students, I think he was able to close this divide. And he gave so much attention and love and admiration for the, the farmer, for, you know, the water carrier. And he really revolutionized and brought the soul back to Judaism in, in many ways. That's really the core um, essence of, of Hasidic life and Hasidic philosophy. Now, there are obviously there are the, the cultural elements to it and the dress and everything, but really it was about bringing the love and acceptance and the soul back to Judaism. And you don't have to be, you don't have to live or dress like a chassid to um, to be able to experience um, this deeper side of 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 Judaism. It's been there always. It's you know chassidus is, is sourced in Kabbalah. Kabbalah was always the deeper esoteric parts of, of Judaism. It's always been there since time immemorial, but it was sort of a very critical point in Jewish history where the Baal Shem Tov was like, okay, we, need to, we really need to get back to what it's all really about and really get back to the core uh, about um, the oneness and about the, the achdut, you know, the unity and seeing things in a very, in a, in a less of a, you know, a, a more of a, a deep, on a much deeper level, and well, ultimately that brought acceptance. Um, and then, you know, that's that's the core of it, and that's what I mean when I say Hasidic philosophy. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like, um, at least the the way you explained it, it sounded it sounds like this idea of being inspired in the everyday is just part and parcel of what it means to be Hasidic, what it means to be a Hasidic person. Is that would you, would you say so? Um, yeah, I mean it's it's a, it's a frame of mind. It's a, you know it's a paradigm. It's how do you view the world? Um, do you view the world of, of is it you know just a combination of matter? You know a bunch of uh, physical things coming together, or is it you know spirit and matter? And when you realize that the whole world is the essence of everything is spirit, it's just about trying to find and discover that spirit in every other person and that's why you know the love was a very big um, you know loving the fellow was 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 probably the fundamental of his teaching because it wasn't just about you know one love and and, and getting together but it was really just about viewing the world in its in, in an essence type of uh, in an essence type of way and viewing things for what they really are the spirit of things and having trying and striving in a lifetime um, to view the spirit so to speak rather mm -hmm. than the matter. Mm -hmm. So, um, at least when, when I was 
you know, when I'm listening to your music and I hear that you are inspired by things in the everyday and I sort of make the connections as to how Judaism itself sort of encourages us to live, live that way, um, the first thing I think about is like brachot, for instance. Like you're, you're, about to, you're about to eat an apple and before you, before you even take a bite of it, you, you say this blessing and, and kind of elevate that material thing. Um, but, I, but I would love to hear from you. What sort of examples would you say of? Are, are there other kind of mechanisms or tools that that Judaism has for for us to um, help kind of build it into the system that we're is supposed to be inspired by everyday things? Well, I, I think I'm, I, I'd, I'd actually rather just expound on, on on the example that you you brought. That's actually a perfect example, better than I would probably would have thought. Um, sweating away on this hangout. Um, it's funny as a, as a, as a as a you know musician and a performer. It's so easy to sit in front of people, a crowd of a hundred, a crowd of a thousand, and and do your thing. There's something about this um, <laughs> this thing that's it's making me a little bit nervous because um, you don't know what, you don't know who's out there. I don't know. Maybe like my first grade teacher is out there watching me right now. I don't even know. I hope so. She'd be very proud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you you brought up a a, a wonderful example. Um, it's sort of the you know why it, you know what is the reason the 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 reason why we make a blessing before in Judaism what is the reason of why we make a blessing on so many things that we do? Okay, so let's take example. You're biting into an apple. Uh, essentially, what you are um, saying. And what you are doing or actualizing when you bite into that apple is that, and this is really another point where everything in this world, I believe, I don't know, based on the Hasidic philosophy, is meant to be elevated. Okay? Um, down from a, a rock all the way to you know, a spouse, a relationship. So you take, let's say, you mentioned the food. When you are making a blessing uh, on, on, on an apple, you're basically saying that this apple has a purpose. Okay? It's not just to sit there and, and, and look pretty, but it's meant to be elevated because the apple does also have a life force to it. Um, and the life force has a purpose. And it's almost like that apple has been waiting forever for you to just take it off that tree, make a blessing, and elevate that apple back to, to its source, back to where it came from. And by making a blessing, you're basically saying, thank you, God, for all of the wonderful, beautiful things that you've given us that make up this world. I am now recognizing okay, that there is a spirit in everything. And by making this blessing, okay, I am elevating this, this apple by making this blessing. And it's just recognizing the spirit um, and the godliness in, in everything. I'm actually, for some reason, my battery just, just drained out like crazy because of this. I'm just going to get my charger, and I'm coming right back. I'm so sorry. No way. So I, I, I love what Moshe is saying, but I think when he comes back, one of the things that um, I'd like to touch on with you, now that you're back, um, is... That feels like a really, uh, I, I think it's such a beautiful concept, but at the same time, it feels like it's a hard thing to sustain, right? To be, um, to be living at a level where every time you wake up in the morning, every time you sit down to eat something, every time you have an interaction with, um, with your, with your spouse, with your family, with your friends, whatever it is. To be um, to live at a level where you're consciously kind of elevating every single um, every single interaction um, sounds kind of like intimidating or draining. And how do you how do you sort of keep up? Um, how do you keep being inspired by by the everyday, by the world around you, um, and and sort of maintain that level of of consciousness or conscientiousness? So, yeah, I mean, I'm not, um, it's very difficult. You know, I grew up, I can only speak for myself, really. Um, and I sort of have um, the home field advantage because, you know, I grew up in a very religious home, okay? 
um, generations of rabbis, literally. My father is a rabbi, my grandfather was a rabbi. Um, I'm surrounded by all these rabbis. Um, sounds like a nightmare, right? Like a really like a horror movie. Um, and it's always been part and parcel and really ingrained into my DNA. Um, so I have a lot of habit. Okay, I'm not. Um, you know, I've, I'm ingrained with a lot of habit. So if anything, you know, for someone maybe, and I'm just going to speak for myself, it's rarely. Do when I bite an apple, am I thinking about the spirits and the the matrix and the and the? I'm really I'm just eating an apple really, and and when I'm making a blessing, it's just it's it's habit, and I'm just making a blessing. But and you know, but sometimes you know what things like this today, and I'm not to sound like cliche or anything, but um, I, I'm actually very grateful for an opportunity like this and for an organization like Eli Talks. You, Miriam, and and you, this organization, is that's basically really essentially your mission. And it's basically okay, we have all these ideas and all these things floating around, but let's you know, let's um, commit and let's um, focus on 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 you know finding that inspiration. So it's it's you know I can imagine some people who didn't grow up religious, and um, maybe it's less habitual for them. And they would have to every time really invigorate and ask themselves, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And that's beautiful. And I think that, um, you know, I think it's it's things like this, just really stopping and saying, okay, why are we doing this? You know, um, and that's life. That's that's the road. That's the road of life. So, you know, music has helped me a lot with that. Um, in my personal thing, um, I. I've always never been able, even growing up um, religious and growing up in a Hasidic home, I've always been very hungry um, for, for the kavana, for the intention of why am I doing this. And I think that's really one of the things that the underlying why I went into the music because I felt like a lot of times I felt uninspired and I felt that if I could commit a life to inspiring other people, perhaps that could help me inspire myself. Now, I actually, I, I'll share a story with you um, on, 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 this, on this thought. So, this story was told um, by my late grandfather, and he said, tells a story about in um, 1944, on the road to, in a train, on a road to Auschwitz, in the, in the corner of, of a train, it was a freezing cold night, it was a winter night, and there was an old man and a very young man standing next to each other. And it was a freezing cold night, and they had many, many miles and, um, and many hours to go. And the old man looks to the young man and he says, and he tells me, I'm, I'm, if, you, if, if, I, if you don't rub me, I'm going to die. It's, it's, it, it's freezing cold, and I'm going to get... I'm, I'm going to get sick, and it's just I won't survive this. So he tells me to rub me. So the young man starts to rub his hand and starts to rub his body, and he's holding him in the corner of a train. And he's rubbing him. He's rubbing his rubbing. And then he stops because the young guy, he gets, he's getting tired. You know, 20 minutes, he's rubbing him. And then, so he gets tired, and then the old man looks at him again. He says, don't stop. Don't stop. You don't understand. You have to keep rubbing me. So, And it goes through the whole night like this. And he rubs him for 20 minutes. He stops. The old man says, you can't stop. You have to continue the whole night. In the morning, when they, they came to Auschwitz, they opened up the train, and his entire, the entire car of people had passed. And the only two people that were alive was this old man and this young man. Mm. Okay, So the old man was alive because he was being rubbed, because he was being kept alive. Um, but the young man also stayed alive because he was rubbing him. And because he was nurturing him. So I find, I guess, in essence, I find the way that I, I guess this is coming to fruition here, my, my thoughts here. I guess if you really break it down, the way that I have found to stay inspired in the everyday is by making it my mission to inspire other people. And I mm -hmm. think that uh, by, by doing that, it has kept me inspired. Um, the same way this young man, you know, the old man stayed alive because he was being inspired. 
but the inspirer by you know by default also stays alive mm. um, yeah mm. wow <laughs> I love it that's it's really intense <laughs> um, it reminds Sorry. me a little bit of it's like that. Friday, 1 p.m. Mushy, yeah. relax. You know? <laughs> I'm not ready. I'm just trying to eat my lunch. Um, <laughs> I, there's, it's so interesting because there's there's been all of these studies lately about happiness and gratefulness, and w one would think, you know, just sort of out in the world, that if you're happy, you're going to be grateful. Um, but it turns out that the opposite is actually true, that if you practice gratefulness, that's what actually makes you happy. And so what you're, what you're saying kind of reminds me of that, right? If you want to be inspired, then making it your business to inspire others is actually what kind of turns that around. So I, I, I love it. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and that, yeah, because we don't, none of us live in a foxhole. You know, none of us live the world. And this goes back to the Baal Shem Tov, realizing that you know, Tarzan wasn't very happy, you know. I mean, maybe because he had the animals. But, you know, the world, we live in this symbiotic world. Everyone, you know, relationships is, is essential to, to living a happy life. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially, it's we all feed off each other. Um, and if we mm -hmm. focus less on ourselves, I think, I guess that's even a deeper point. I think if we... We're trying to find happiness, and we're we're focusing so much on, oh, what do you you know what type of pills we need to take today to, to become happy, or what type of you know therapy? Maybe we should be focusing a little bit less on ourselves, right? Maybe mm -hmm. focusing a little bit less on ourselves and just thinking about realizing that, um, and focus more on others, and focus more around us, and focus more on sharing. And I think retroactively. Mm -hmm that will make you a more happy person. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, it's a great point to move into our a question from the audience. And um, so Alan asks, uh, there seems to be so many divisions and negative judgments among Jews of all stripes today. Um, why is it so difficult for Jews to find the kind of love the, the Besh had, the Baal Shem Tov had? Um, how do we fight our urge to judge and how do we react to judgment from others? Um, which I think is is definitely related to this idea of, of inspiration and, and togetherness and sort of recognizing these um, different, you know, sort of elements, the life force in, in different things. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So could you, I'm sorry, can you read the, you cut off for one second. Can you read the question yeah. one more time? Yeah. So um, Alan asks, why is it so difficult for Jews to kind of find the love for one another that the Baal Shem Tov was, was preaching? That's, um, if there's a lot of divisiveness and a lot of judgment, and um, so why is that so hard? And how do we how do we deal with judgment, either um, keeping from judging others or reacting to others judging us? Great question. So I think the essence of that in, um, is I think people are always trying to protect a certain truth, right? I think for the most part, people have good intentions and they're trying to protect something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a truism, something that is true to them. And then if the other person seemingly doesn't uh, abide by the same truth, um, then there's conflict and it, and, it, and, it, and it creates conflict. But I think the Torah, um, in, in its great wisdom, um, one of the fundamentals of Torah uh, is that there are Shiva Panim the Torah. You know, there are 70 faces. Of, of the Torah. And there are 70 faces of, of truth, essentially. And what, is that, what does that mean? Um, the truth is not a definite thing. Truth is very relative um, to um, people's experience, people, people's background, and truth isn't really judged by man. Okay? Yes, God gave us a, a blueprint to live, to live by, and he gave us the Torah the truth to live by, but at the end of the day, when it comes to judgment, we don't judge the people. Only God judges judges people. So I think that people, in their in their in their effort to protect their truth, um, that's where the conflict begins. And I think if people would take a step back and realize that the other person is just really in his good intended trying. For the most part, and I think we talk about it on a global level and historically, 
people are just trying trying to um, protect their truth, and they get angry that and they almost feel if if I believe this to be true, based on my understanding or based on my level of observance or based on my understanding level of observance, um, you automatically. Um, because you have either a higher or a lower level of observance, you you, dis you disagree and you argue. But I think that's even a dangerous place, and we should, and you, us as human beings, should never even go to that place because that place of judgment is only meant for for God to judge. Um, and I think you know, if God wanted, this is an interesting I once read. You know, if God wanted um, to be this one um, one way for everybody. Um, we already had that before the creation of the world. Everything was just yichud. It was just one. It was oneness. There was no diversity. There was no, um, there was just one opinion. There wasn't even an opinion. No one had opinions before the world was created. I think the beauty of, 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 of how God created the world, that he created multiple opinions and multiple directions and I think the what we need to strive for is that not that we should all you know try to find the same road, and this is also a mistake I think people make when they when they when it comes to Jewish you know diversity and and and, and Jewish strife. The purpose wasn't to find one direction that everybody can take. I think the purpose was to realize that there are multiple directions, and there are multiple um, approaches, and then despite the multiple different type of approaches, we should still get along. Despite that, I think that's what happened when God created the world. He says, okay, I'm going to create all these different religions. In, within religions, I'm going to create all these different sects. Within these sects, I'm going to create all these different opinions, right? And they say, okay, now go, right? It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like a cat, it's like a cockfight, you know, like throwing a bunch of chickens into, uh, into <laughs> one big, one big pot. And I think um, by realizing that despite our differences is really what God wants us, to, despite the different opinions and despite the different approaches, the challenge is to still get along and to still respect people. You got my way, you got your way, I respect you, um, and only, you know, only God knows and only God judges. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's take some of these heavy ideas and translate it into music. Um, you've got a song called Inspire Me, which it sounds like feels like an appropriate one to address now. Can you tell us a little bit about that song, how it came to be, and what it's about? Yeah. Um, so the song started, um, I was on the roof of my house in Brooklyn, um, and it was at night, and I was out there with my pen and paper, and I was like, okay, got to take a break. Kids are asleep. Um, Let's write a song, and nothing was coming to nothing was coming to me. And, and I saw these white pigeons. I was like, and it, I was like, and they didn't look like I mean, white pigeons. How often you sing, and they looked like doves to me. And I was just like, whoa! It it really inspired me. And I and I it it started off this song about finding inspiration in the most simple things. And then you go deeper into the song. Um, the refrain is. Um, what inspires me the most is a nine to five, and and you know well as I do, it ain't easy to survive. So, um, I think it's that song is really about finding inspiration in the everyday. Um, not all of us, and I've gone through that in my life because you know I started off as, you know, just doing music for years, you know, and just thinking, and then reality set in, and it's like, okay, now I got to take a nine to five job. And now I got to work, and then I've been, you know, went into into the startup field, and I'm still doing the music, thank God. But it's like, okay, you can't just live, you know, um, live on the road your whole life. Um, and finding inspiration in my nine to five job, really, essentially. So that's what that song's about. It's just um, you know, a big difference between Judaism and 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 Buddhism is that Buddhism is about, you know, escape. Um, escaping the world and trying to, you know, elevate yourself above and beyond the world. Judaism is very unique, where it's about you got to be in the world and you got to have your nine to five and you got to be able to um, find that inspiration within the nine to five. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, and the the last piece that I wanted to touch on before we wrap up is that there's. You know, we talked before about how, you know, it's it's hard to be inspired every day with the sort of 
the grind and the, the habits and you just sort of get into a, a flow and, and how do you sort of keep that mindfulness. But I think there's also a challenge when you come up against these really difficult situations. Like, you know, right now, for those of us watching live, um, there were three young men who were recently kidnapped from their from their yeshiva and um, there's a there's a great sort of consciousness raising among a lot of the Jewish world and, and wanting to get them back and it's a really um, it's a it's a difficult trying situation and for you know I'm a new mother and I'm thinking about what that must feel like for their families and it's just really really difficult and um, so I, I wonder if you could say a little bit about just being in those um, sort of unusually difficult moments, and um, I'm also I'm also thinking about your song Lamplighters. Um, if you want to say a little bit about about that as well. Um, yeah. So I guess um, you know it, it is a very very difficult time with these um, with these boy with these with these boys, and we really. It doesn't make sense, you know, why you know terrible things like this happen to um, to innocent children. Hold on one second. You know, um, it actually it spurred a thought for me. You know, the the Chabad Rebbe, who's you know who's um, who's his twentieth year of passing is is coming up um, very soon. Um, he's actually got a lot of attention this year, and twenty he has a. His a book called Rebbe just hit New York Times best bestseller, mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of controversy um, the years after the Holocaust, um, and there was a, another um, Jewish rabbi who 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 tried to um, excuse the Holocaust um, because of certain behavior for, by certain from certain groups of Jews, um, and say that that's why the Holocaust happened. And the Rebbe, um, in, in, in a very famous talk, um, actually cried his heart out. And I listened to that tape many times where um, we, to say that bad things happen for reasons or that the Holocaust happened um, because of a particular reason um, that we could even fathom um, is, a, is a complete fallacy. Um, and he said, and, and it was just... God does certain things, and we just simply cannot understand um, why they do, and we just have to focus on on prayer. We have to focus on everything that we can physically do to prevent these things happening in the future. My wife and I lived in in in, in Israel after we got married. We lived in in Jerusalem. Uh, my heart it's very much. Um, um, Goes out for 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 these boys, um, and you know the most we can do what we can do. You know we can from here in New York we can pray. We can be part of all these social media activities. I think it's very important to become to 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 share this this um, you know hashtag bring back our boys. Um, it 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 affects um, the media. It affects the 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 politics. It brings attention. And, and which eventually attention will turn into possibly to support for for the for the IDF. So I think it's important that we do what we can. Um, going into into the song Lamp Letters, um, you know the, the the message behind the song Lamp Letters is someone once asked you know a great Hasidic rabbi he says what is a person who wants to be a Hasid? What is a person who wants to live their life? Like like a chassid. And remember, a chassid again is not uh, someone who wears a big furry hat. It's a lifestyle, and it's a and it's a state of and it's a state of mind. And he said, well, a chassid is a person who goes out and he finds these lamps. Oh, a chassid is a lamp lighter, right? In the olden days, there weren't a switch where you can turn it on or the street lights. There were actually these lamps that were out in the streets, and um, there was something someone called a lamplighter, which was it was his job to go out and ignite these 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 torches, um, and they said that's what a chassid is, a chassid who makes it his responsibility to go out and to bring light in, in, into the world and to help people on their path and to help people on their way. Um, so 
the 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 person ask the person ask the Rebbe, but what if I don't see any empty lights or any of these lights that need to be that need to be lit up? And they say, well, you have to go travel the entire world and 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 find these lights, and you have to make an effort, okay, to go find these 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 potentials, okay, these lamps that need to be lit to find and go out and make it your life mission to go out and find this potential, become a lamplighter. And he says, and then he asked him, well, what if the lamps are in the middle of the ocean? So the Rebbe said, well, then you jump into the ocean, and you swim into the middle of the ocean. And he says, what if it's in a desert? Then you go into the desert. Um, and that's really, it's a life that I strive for, you know, um, in my little way, with my music, with my family, um, to try and find these, you know, these potentials, you know, these unsparked, these unlit um, lamps. And, you know, um, the, Rebbe, the Rebbe taught us, you know, my Rebbe taught us that, you know, when should, who is a teacher and when should a person start teaching and sharing? You know, when he knows the entire alphabet, the Rebbe said no. The Rebbe said, if you know Aleph, you know one letter Aleph, then you teach Aleph. If you know Bayes, then go and teach Bayes. Don't wait until you know all of the alphabet, all of the Hebrew letters, until you start teaching. If you know one letter, if you know one thought, if you're, if you're a person that has something to share, then go and teach it, okay? So I guess that's, you know, and I, and I think it, it sort of ties in with everything that we're saying. We're here in America. I think that you can find something you can do um, um, to help with the efforts for these kids. I think that I'm a singer and I use music to share my inspiration because that's what I am. I know Olive. I'm not a big scholar, okay? I don't know, um, I don't know everything, but I know a little. And in order to maintain the inspiration in my life, I teach Olive. And maybe I know a little bit about bass, but not Gimel. <laughs> We'll save that for another yeah. talk then. Um, I think so. I think that's a beautiful place to close our conversation. Um, and I thank you for teaching us all today and for sharing your time and your talent. And um, thank you to everyone who joined us live, to everyone who's watching afterwards. Um, Eli on Air happens every Thursday of 1 p.m. Eastern, unless we tell you otherwise and we switch things up a little bit. Um, so you can check us out next week with another guest and other inspired Jewish ideas. And um, keep the conversation going. The video will be available. And um, please check out Moshe's music online if you're in need of another boost of inspiration later in the day. So thank you again, Moshe. And thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next week. My pleasure. Thank you.